would like to begin by acknowledging the traditional custodians of the land on which I live and work, the Gundagara land and people. I pay my respects to their elders, past, present and emerging, and extend that respect to all Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people. I also want to acknowledge the traditional custodians of the lands on which you, our listeners, are joining us from today. I recognise the deep connection that First Nations people have to this land, their enduring culture and their commitment to the preservation and care for their country. This land was never ceded, and it always was and always will be Aboriginal land. Hey there, and welcome to this special bonus episode of Beyond the Surface. In these episodes, we take a break from the personal stories, and I get to chat with experts on all things related to religious trauma, cults, and deconstruction. These conversations are foundational and educational. They provide deeper insights and understanding into the complexities of the experiences we hear in the stories. Whether you're just beginning your journey, this is the first episode you're listening to, or maybe you're looking to expand your knowledge in general. These episodes are packed with valuable information that will help you navigate wherever you are. I'm your host, Sam, and this is Beyond the Surface. Welcome to another bonus episode of Beyond the Surface. Today, I am joined by two people who you already know and love. They've both been on the podcast um, already sharing their own stories. Uh, Jane Kennedy and Elise Hurd, welcome. Thank you. Thanks. Hi. <laughs> um, before we kick straight into uh, what we are going to be talking about, um, I'm just going to throw to both of you to just do a quick introduction of who you are and where in the world you are. Jane, do you want to start? So, yeah, so I am Jane. I am a therapist working on Gadigal land. Amazing. Elise? Hi, I'm Elise Hurd uh, and I'm a trauma-informed therapist and coach uh, and I work in Melbourne, Victoria in the Western suburbs. Amazing. And uh, most people, I think by now, because it has been a couple of months or a month and a half, I think, by the time this will be out, which is that we are all the co-founders of the Religious Trauma Collective Australia and New Zealand which is really exciting and that's obviously what we're here to chat about today just to give people a bit of an overview of who we are, what we're doing, why we're doing it. Um, we're we're going to go the who, what, where, when and why sort of, <laughs> um, sort of approach. Um, so to start with, I thought I would just give a, you know, a really quick overview of what the collective is. Um, and so essentially we created the Religious Trauma Collective to be a space of community, connection, support and understanding. They were the things that we really wanted to target. We wanted to create a community of practitioners who work in this space um, in really trauma-informed and safe ways. Uh, religious trauma is not a well-understood area, particularly in our part of the world, and so it was really important for us to be able to create a registry of sorts of practitioners who could um, create community within the practitioners but could offer support uh, for those who are seeking support around religious trauma um, and to create a bit of a resource hub so that we can uh, get more understanding. Uh, we love our friends over in the US and the UK in particular and their resources, um, but we also have some really great resources here in Australia and New Zealand, uh, particularly in the form of like memoirs and people's stories. And so uh, that part of understanding is really key, I find, in, in memoirs because that's where we, mm. uh, we really see the impact of religious trauma and the impact of spiritual abuse. And, um, and so, yeah, we wanted to be able to highlight and platform uh, those resources because they're often the ones that are going to relate to the people who live in Australia and New Zealand. The language is different. Uh, the landscape is different. And that's also something we will chat about later in the episode. Um, but yeah, do, I mean, I'm going to throw to either of you, if you want to expand on, on the purpose of the collective and what it actually is. I think you explained it really well. 
Yeah, you did great. I can add to that. (laughs) Amazing. (laughs) Um, Okay, so I'm going to, I think, you know, when we talk about why the collective is important, uh, I think we broadly know why it's important in the landscape of of community and, and the area of the world we are in, which can sometimes feel a little disjointed to the rest of the world. Um, but I think all of us had quite personal reasons as to why the collective was also important. Um, and so we're going to do a little bit of a round table as to why that is. Um, and so I'm going to throw to Elise first as to why, why it was important for you personally that we create this space. Yeah. Thanks, Sam. It, um, yeah, it's deeply personal to me, um, why this space is so important. Um, And like you said, we've talked about a lot of the generics and we'll talk a little bit more about that. Um, But for me personally, I, when I experienced um, trauma within the evangelical Pentecostal kind of mega church world, I accidentally just lucked out and found a counsellor who just happened to be able to name my experience when I had zero language for it. At all. So I didn't even know to be looking for a practitioner or a therapist that understood religious trauma because I had no idea that that's what it even was at that point. Um, but finding a finding a therapist for myself who was able to understand it, name it for me, and then walk that journey with me was really important. Um, and for myself personally, now being in the space where I'm working with clients that uh, have experienced religious trauma or spiritual abuse, um, hearing the stories of re-traumatization when they've gone to practitioners that haven't understood it, they just haven't had the knowledge or the understanding, um, and seeing kind of the, the additional harm or the extra layers that come with that, has made it really important for me personally to be part of a space like this, um, not only for the clients, but for the practitioners that really want to understand more about religious trauma that can help people to name their experience and put language around that um, and to create the safe spaces for clients to be able to, um, yeah, not have to explain in depth the things that have happened because the practitioner will just get it and they'll know why things were traumatizing. Um, I just think like a really quick example for me this morning when we're recording this, it's a Sunday morning. Um, And for me getting up and actually getting a little bit dressed up for this was actually really triggering because it's Sunday morning and that's what I used to do every Sunday morning was get up and get dressed up. But my immediate response was, that's okay. I'll take it to therapy because my, my therapist will fully understand why that was a big deal. Yeah. yeah. And so it's little, it's little things like that that actually make this space really important. Um, yeah. And it's why I'm really personally invested in this space. Mm. I mean, the fun thing is, is that we also get that yeah. <laughs> probably on a much more <laughs> um, level as well. But um, I mean, rather than going to church, we do a podcast on religious trauma. I mean, that's just like. Yeah. Same, same. Yeah, yeah exactly. <laughs> um, and so, yeah, I, you know, that I think having language for your experiences is one of those things that um, is if not the, but one of the most important parts of healing and trauma recovery is actually just having language for what your experiences are. Yeah. Jane? Yeah, I I, I got a little bit giggly there thinking about, um, I actually had a client this week who was talking about the prayer of Jabez. I don't know if either of you remember that. But it's just like this whole, you know, every so often in kind of, Pentecostal world there'll be like this random thing that pops up that you have to kind of it's either the purpose-driven life or the prayer of Jabez oh. or some other thing that you have to kind of get on the bandwagon with and and she mentioned it and I just laughed and just went yep I'm with you mm. <laughs> or you know Kenneth Copeland or some oh. random Benny Hinn prayer hanky or something Ooh. um so yeah I think I think for me um I realized that it's been 20 years since I started to unpack 
some of this. I started to question some of the um, some of the things that had been very formative, very real, very normal for me. And so that predated smartphones. It predated podcasts. It predated um, internet that wasn't dial up, and it predated social media. Yeah. So I'm outing myself that I'm 52. And so 20 years ago, you know, like I was trying to figure stuff out and really just not, you know, knowing where to turn. And Brian McLaren, I always laugh, was my gateway drug to deconstruction because <laughs> he had this beautiful trilogy, A New Kind of Christianity, I think is the first one. And then there was um, that was kind of my my dive into a more progressive faith and I stayed there for a long time. But I was listening to... Um, mp3 files of rob bell's sermons you know when he started to talk about stuff he was questioning when he was still in ministry and and then there was blogs they were like the new cool thing that were popping up and so i started to sort of read things but like we were saying before like there's it's quite different in our part of the world and i couldn't really find anyone questioning or talking about things publicly in australia um and so it was it kind of felt quite lonely and and I just remember thinking uh, when I was sort of reflecting on that this morning, like it just it, it just would have been so powerful and it wouldn't have taken me so long, I don't think, to kind of completely feel at home in myself, separate from all of this, um, if I'd had people to connect to. And and I and the idea of going to therapy then wasn't even a thing. Mm-hmm. Like you could have a Christian counsellor, but there was no way I was going to be unpacking that with a Christian counsellor. Um, because I was too scared to even say the stuff that I was doubting out loud. So, you know, like there was this whole disconnect there. So having something like this would have been incredible to just be able to go, there is this, you know, this wealth of kind of information from people who are telling their stories and there's books I can read and there's um, kind of a more academic understanding that I can wrap my brain around. There's there's kind of models and frameworks I can you know, kind of see a bit more clearly because it's like, oh, it kind of works like this. and But it, it just felt really kind of woolly and um, hard to kind of touch back then. And it took me a lot longer to heal and to kind of feel like I could, you know, um, feel like I could sort of come back to myself probably for the first time in a grounded way like it took me a long time to not feel as wobbly as I did so I hope my hope is that this resource is something that we can offer to people to be able to go oh it's kind of like that me too you know like oh there I am reflected on you know this this web page um and here's people I can connect with in a real way yeah and I think there is such a plethora of resources and information now uh than yeah. even five years ago you know mm. and Um, And looking for that information is uh, and seeking support is hard enough when you are in Mm. that stage to be able to offer that on one website where they can see that actually in the resources there is everything from trauma recovery to progressive faith to sex Mm. and sexuality and, Mm -hmm. and to not feel like, um, they have to Google everything themselves because that can feel really overwhelming in itself to be trying to, you know, what even is there out there. And so. And even knowing what to Google. Yeah. What, yeah, what, what, absolutely. what are my search words? I don't have language for this. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, mm. absolutely. Um, I mean, I, for me personally, I was similarly to Elise, I was lucky that I found a therapist who knew this space um, and by lucky, I mean, I Googled for like six months and ensured that like, so not necessarily lucky. It was very targeted. I was not just going to anybody. Um, and that was largely because um, finding somebody who at the time I was still very much trying to uh, wrestle with um consolidating and integrating my sexuality and my faith at the time. And so having somebody who understood all of that was just like a really narrow window to try and get. Um, And so I was lucky in that I found an ex-pastor who could, you know, rip apart theology and passages and Mm. doctrine with me. And that was what I needed. Um, But 
I'm very conscious now as a therapist and I was a therapist at the time as well, but like as a therapist working with religious trauma, um, that there are just a lot of people out there who, who don't have the ability to do that and, and that's okay. But, um, the problem is, is that unfortunately that's ending up in a whole bunch of re-traumatization and harm done in people who are jumping from therapist to therapist, which is hard enough as it is to find a good fit for you, but to find a good fit that um, understands the language that you're talking about. I mean, you know, we talk, I talk a lot about the fact that I don't want my clients to educate me. I don't want them to have to feel like they need to filter their language during our sessions. And it certainly doesn't mean that I know absolutely everything because, um, Jane, I have no idea what a prayer hanky is. <laughs> like I've, I've heard a lot of terminologies, but I've not heard of that. But so like, I mean, like it's not about knowing absolutely everything, but it's about sort of like there is, you know, an understanding of, of the experiences of, of what people are going through. Um, and so, I mean, before, okay, before we go to the next question, Jane, what is a prayer hanky? Look, famously, um, Benny Hinn, right. who's a bit of a nut job kind of, mm. um, you know, faith healer, private jet kind of a guy, um, he, you could pay, unsurprisingly, to receive a prayer hanky in the mail that he had like prayed over. Oh, and so then you Lord. would just kind of, um, you know, apply it to yourself. You would hold it, you would keep it, you might, maybe you keep it in your Bible, you know. Um, and it, it's kind of like the, I guess, the concept of holy water. It was something that had been blessed that would ensure your, your healing. So, yeah. Right. Okay. Yikes. Um, I mean, the the fun part of this journey is that you learn new things every day and new terminology every day. Um, but yeah, so I guess it was important for me because I, I knew what it was like to have a therapist who got it, who, and, and to not have to feel like I needed to explain, you know, the, impact of the clobber passages or even what that terminology even means and, and things like that. Um, and so I, I guess it was important to be able to create a space where people didn't feel like they needed to jump from therapist to therapist to therapist, just like continually either being invalidated or not heard, not understood, or, you know, even harmed and re-traumatized by, other practitioners who just who just didn't get it for a variety of different reasons um and so to create a space of um amplifying those who do get it and uh and pe perhaps educating and resourcing those who don't currently um because that's also important so mm -hmm. um in terms of, uh, you know, we are very specific about the fact that this is Australia and New Zealand uh, and highlighting that this is, you know, we really wanted to amplify um, our part of the world. Um, and so, Jane, I'm wondering whether you can just chat a little bit about why that was important for us and why mm. it's Yeah, I mean, I think the first, the first reason is kind of, um, I guess I touched on a little bit before, like I was looking for people who were like me, who understood my context, my story, um, the way that Pentecostalism, um, you know, that was my background, part of the mega churches and um, mega church world in Australia. And so I kind of would love to have had somebody from within that space kind of go, oh, yeah, you know, like I'm, I'm kind of questioning this too or trying to, you know, figure out how this is okay and that's okay. And like, so I think I was looking around to try to connect with people on a more personal level and just realize that there just there just weren't many people there were some people doing it in a like a tabloid kind of a way and like um you know there was a lot of vitriol and a lot of kind of um i'd even use the word kind of toxic language that was kind of going around and and that really scared me like that made me feel really uncomfortable and i'm just like i can't actually um I don't want to connect with that because it doesn't feel safe, but I would love a place to kind of be okay to just have some doubts. Mm. And so 
um so I think that was the first thing is like we you know I was I was looking around desperately trying to find something and then over the last I think that like you say the last five years ten years a lot more stories from Australia and New Zealand have come out because there's also been a lot more um and I think actually in 2013 the Royal Commission into um, sexual abuse within religious institutions in Australia that really brought it to kind of like the public space yeah. and people had been talking about abuse in the Catholic Church in Australia and around the world for a long time there was movies from the US and all of that but when we actually had quantifiable um, kind of evidence and data that sort of said this is what we're dealing with here and this is, um, you know, there's, there's redress that has to happen here and a whole lot of denominations in Australia signed on to that redress, um, it, it became a lot more public. And so then people started to become more um, courageous and would write their stories. And like I know Steph Lentz, you know, had her story in the paper before her book was released. You know, like there's people like that that kind of gradually started to pop up. And then more recently, over the last two or three years, both in Australia and New Zealand, we've started to see some of these mega churches start to implode. Mm -hmm. And so we've seen sort of big name leaders, you know, um, falling from grace in different ways um, very publicly. And so I think if people have been, you know, wanting to go, well, how, how did that happen and how was that possible? And so I think in, in Australia and New Zealand, it's um, there's been a lot of, you know, people come from New Zealand to Australia and vice versa. Um, it's very similar denominationally the way that, you know, we understand faith and the language we use is quite similar. But also for both nations in the most recent census data, um, we are largely secular nations. So I think for the first time since census data has been collected, the um, it's under 50% people saying that they um, are Christians or that they go to a Christian church. Mm. And so the landscape is very much, you know, um, shifting. So it's not, you know, we were talking before about in the US, it's it's quite in the water, you know, particularly, and Christian nationalism is a really big thing and, you um, you know, it's, it's it very much influences elections. Um, I think that is changing here as well a little bit. I think we're starting to see more of that, probably influenced by the US, but it hasn't traditionally been the way that things have been here or in New Zealand. There's a lot more um, uh, scepticism, <laughs> you know, more cynicism. Um, people don't like the whole tall poppy thing. We're very quick to kind of pull that down. Um so it just looks quite different and I think it, it was important to us that we acknowledge that and that we, um, yeah, and amplify the stories of people in Australia and New Zealand who have been through this experience and um, and those that are supporting them and ways to sort of rebuild spirituality. Yeah. 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 Elise, was there something in particular that you wanted to highlight around uh, the importance of focusing you know, on Australia and New Zealand? Yeah, I think, um, you know, with so much being online and the whole world being a lot more connected than it ever has been before, um, it, it's great to be able to, you know, connect with lots of different people in lots of different places, but there's also a, a certain kind of courage that comes with being in community and having that mm. the community of not just survivors that are speaking up but practitioners that are starting to work in this area um, and there's just a certain level of courage that comes with having that close community that's actually in, like Jane said, living in the same kind of water that you are um, and really understands those nuances that exist within Australia and New Zealand. Um, and so while there are, there are great connections that we've got in this space that are overseas, um, it's, yeah, there's just a certain level of courage that comes when you you know you've got that community really close to home. So yeah. I think that's really important. Yeah, absolutely. I think I even find when I'm doing these podcast recordings that when I'm sitting, I'm sitting virtually across from an Australian or, or or a New Zealander that there is like, it's almost like a comfort, like an ease, like, you know, there is commonality, there's common ground, the language is the same, the landscape is the same. Um, you know, Jane, you and I were talking before we hit record about the fact that, like, yeah, the landscape is just wildly different. Like, it's just not baked into our 
politics into our everyday society like it is particularly in the US and obviously you know we keep referencing the US because uh, I mean we tend to use the US as like our frame of reference for basically everything um, and so you know we don't it's just not it's just not baked into society the same way it is that there are actually so much more So there is so much more to our society than the church that you go to or the faith that you hold or the political party that you vote for and, and things like that, whereas that's largely all wrapped up under the banner of, um, you know, the fact that they the U.S. is considered a Christian nation and, uh, and a, you know, in God we trust and God bless America and, you know, all of that sort of overt, very religious language that we just... We just don't have here in Australia, and I think we saw the impact. Um, we saw the impact of uh, a prime minister bringing their religious beliefs into their term, uh, and we, quite frankly, really fucking hated it. Uh, well, I did. I don't know about you guys, but I did. Um, and uh, and and I guess we saw that like. Actually, we don't love when religion and politics mix. Uh, and and I think that that's a really uh, key difference. Um, and I mean, also in that, like in broad society in Australia, uh, we actually don't use the term evangelical a whole lot, right? Yeah. Like that's a huge term in the US and and we use it now or I use it now because it's, a broad term that everybody tends to understand in this sphere and in this world. Um, but in the church that I was in, evangelical would not have been a term that we would have used. Evangelism, yes, but evangelical, not so much. Uh, and so even just like pulling it down to like the different types of language, the different types of, you know, denominations by name that we have in Australia, it's... Um, <clears throat> It's just being able to connect on a different level uh, with uh, with people who understand it. Um, and also, again, we feel so far away from everybody, so it's nice to just, like, have resources and people um, in, in our part of the world. Um, and, I mean, from a therapist practitioner point of view, um, there are, like, logistics as well that we wanted to consider in that, Uh, you can't always freely work with a practitioner internationally to, because of like things like registration and insurances and things like that. And so, time zone. <laughs> yeah, time zones. Yeah. yeah what, like I recording these podcasts it, with the U S <laughs> folk is just like not a fun, uh, not a fun time all the, um, all of the time with, uh, the time zone differences, but there were also just those logistical things in that we wanted, Uh, the ease of people being able to find practitioners that they could actually work with, not, oh, I found someone and then, you know, to be hit with a wall of of um, of issues or or barriers of not being able to work with that person. So I think they were all, uh, you know, key factors in terms of why we wanted to really um, narrow in and highlight our part of the world. Um On our website, we talk about noticing the gaps uh, in in this space, in particular, again, in Australia and New Zealand. Um, and I thought it would be helpful to just have a bit of a chat about what we see those gaps are. Um, and so I realise I keep sort of like throwing it in one direction all of the time. So I'm just going to leave this nice and broad and open and whoever wants to talk first can. Uh, where do you start with gaps? I feel like there are, yeah, we do talk a lot about how we're wanting to kind of fill the gaps that are there. Um, maybe one of the one of the gaps that I would highlight is really that knowledge around the language that is used because, as we know, with trauma and particularly in a high control environment, whether that's religious, family whatever environment that is, the language is really important mm -hmm. and the language is usually one of those key things that's used to control. Um, and um, and so when you then add the religious elements to that, um, and, again, this can be different across denominations, um, what kind of 
language is used. Um, like before, Sam wasn't aware of what a prayer hanky was. I was because I probably come from more the kind of background that Jane comes from. Um, so I was aware of that. But again, if there's practitioners working in this space that um, either have lived experience in a different denomination, a different religion, um, there's there's different language that they're going to be able to understand. And so there's not just the gap in practitioners understanding religious trauma in general, but specifically understanding religious trauma from different denominations, different religions, um, and each of those come with their own set of language that is you know, I, I grew up in the evangelical world and it's funny that you said about that word, Sam, because at one point I actually had to Google, am I evangelical? Mm-hmm. Like, is that what my belief is? Because that's not the word we would use either. Um, but I was very much. Um, and so there's, you know, there's the, the gap in language and awareness of what that language means and the impact that it has on someone. So for practitioners working with clients that are going to come in using this language because it's usually their whole world. It's usually the only language that they understand. Um, It's the language that impacts what they can and can't do, what's acceptable, what's not acceptable. Um, And so there really is that gap in just the knowledge and awareness of what, um, what language is used in these controlling environments that is really keeping people trapped in that trauma, uh, or especially in that cycle of trauma uh, that they're trying to recover from or trying to move on from. Um, yeah, so I think that's that's definitely one of the gaps that we're wanting to fill is to have the understanding of these, um, you know, what we'd also call the adverse um, religious experiences and understanding how we work with people with their language that they use that they understand um and yeah to be able to support them in a really safe way so again where we're not expecting clients to come in and educate us as the therapist um that we can just be there to support them but to create that space where they can go and find a practitioner who is perhaps has that lived experience in that place that they're trying to come from um, that already has the awareness of that language. Um, and that just doesn't exist in our part of the world at the moment. Yeah. Mm. And I, yeah, I think the, it's, I think the key aspect there as well is like the impact because like people might understand, um, you know, baseline, doctrines or baseline foundational aspects of a belief system Um, but it's often understanding the gravity and the way that something has been pitched to them and I think that's understanding also the way that religious trauma differs to other types of trauma as well as as well as the ways that obviously you know trauma is trauma and we see it largely similar in the body and things like that but there is like aspects of religious trauma that really differ to other types of trauma. And, um, and I suspect I can probably get Jane to talk about it because she's talked about it in other things before, but around, I guess, the, the ways that that does differ, because I think that's part of the gap is that there are practitioners out there who just don't necessarily understand the gravity of, of what religious trauma encompasses. Mm. Yeah, and I think some of those things that, um, yeah, they some of the the do- the key like the foundational doctrines that exist that may sound nice on the surface, mm. but actually carry a whole lot of guilt and fear and shame. Mm-hmm. Um, and yeah, so understanding the impact of those sometimes well-meaning or even well-sounding doctrines mm. um, that actually have a really toxic underbelly. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And I think also the um, the ways in which this experience is so similar to what we now understand about domestic and family violence and mm-hmm. coercive control within that framework. And that, we again, over, really over the last 10, 20 years has only just become kind of well understood in therapy land. Um, and, you know, and the, the old kind of why doesn't she just leave? It's mm. it's the same kind of thing within churches. It's like, oh, but you haven't been there for years. Like, what's what's the problem? Like, or, or if someone's in it still and struggling with their doubts or their, 
you know, whatever is going on for them, for someone to say, well, can you not just leave and go to another church or can you just, you know, walk away? Like it, it just isn't that easy and yeah. you carry so much of it with you um, in the same way. And because, you know, there are experiences co- of coercive control and because there is that whole existential layer of eternity, Mm-hmm. So if you um, I actually had this conversation with someone the other day who was saying that there was um, an academic in a um, in a university in Australia who has written a piece and and she was saying, oh, um, you like sort of defending in a way churches as institutions or religious institutions kind of saying it, the data shows that it, you know, abuse or exploitation or whatever it is, is the same across all institutions. Like the church doesn't have higher data. And firstly, eh, I'm sure that that's true, um, but but even if it was, let's say it is true, if you if you're experiencing abuse or exploitation or any kind of adverse religious or adverse experience within a um, say a university system, that doesn't carry the existential weight of now going to hell. Mm-hmm. So I think that whole um, or being you know struck by lightning or God being displeased with you and um, losing something as intimate and um, you know core to who you are as as a relationship with the divine like that that's not you know like that that's that kind of added layer that I think is really important for people to understand and and currently isn't well understood yeah absolutely I think it's the it is just so wrapped up in who you are as like at the core and not just like a surface who you are but like at the core of who you are Yeah. Yeah. And it's, um, you know, we're talking about like core identity markers and beliefs about yourself, about the world. And for that to not just have um, a present day impact or present day consequences with, you know, um, other, other individuals who are in the community that you're in, but that that has a, an everlasting and an eternal impact. Uh, the weight of that, it, it doesn't just leave when you leave the it's building. It's terrifying. Yeah. 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 And I remember the, the, when I did muster up the courage to see a counsellor and thought, can I see someone who's a secular counsellor? Is that going to be okay? I, I felt like throwing up the whole way to her office. But once I got there, I started to tell her how I felt like I was grieving God and she just kind of like tilted her head and sort of looked at me and went, oh, uh-huh. <laughs> like she just couldn't understand what I was saying. And then she tried to frame it um, in a way that just was completely not relevant to my story because it was coming from her understanding. Um, and it took me a long time to seek out counselling after that because I just thought, well, nobody is going to understand this. So, yeah. 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 So, I think it's so... And I guess that's, you know, what we're highlighting here is the gap of the understanding of practitioners who just get it and who understand that the role of religion in someone's life goes beyond um, prayer and church on a Sunday and comfort during grief and, you know, Mm -hmm. all of those things that are really lovely on the surface. But um, what we're talking about is the role of a faith and a belief system in forming a person's whole identity uh, and and that's very different and the reality is, is that there is um, a subsect of practitioners who don't get it um, and and we would like to start bridging the gap of, of what that looks like so that um, ultimately the the goal is always ultimately so that people uh one land in the therapist offices or the practitioner offices that can help them the best but also so that they're not landing in rooms where they're going to get invalidated or hurt or re-traumatized by what they're sharing mm-hmm. um and I think a lot of practitioners who don't have lived experience really want to understand. Mm, We've certainly yeah. come across a lot of them who are like, I, you know, I want to know more, help me with this language, um, you know, can I tell you about this, you know, presentation or whatever. And and that's exciting because it's there's that willingness to understand and to listen and to go and read or upskill or, or whatever. So that's certainly a big part of it um, for us too. Yeah, um, absolutely. I think, you know, 
knowledge is power and and it we certainly don't sit here going um you have to have lived experience to be able to be an effective practitioner with someone with religious trauma but i think Uh, we do sit here saying that you do need to be conscious of the uniqueness of the religious trauma and be educating yourself about what your client is going through as well. Because um, like Elise, you said, the even the language between denominations is going to look different. It's like all different forms of foreign language. Uh, and if you were not taught it growing up, then you simply don't get it. And, and it's okay to not get it, but it's not okay to then... you know, take that in to, to a session with, with people that you're working with. Um, I think in terms of the gaps, also one of the things that we talked about was that uh, we really wanted this space to encompass the full spectrum of uh, where someone lands in the world of faith, spirituality, agnosticism, atheism, and not feeling like someone needs to land on that spectrum in a particular spot to be able to seek support. Um, and often we find that spaces are either faith spaces or they're anti-faith spaces Turn it all or down. they're, yes, or they're secular spaces. And, and we didn't want that. And, and largely I think the three of us didn't want it because we've probably all been in different spaces as well on that spectrum and are still moving on that spectrum. And it is not ever something that is stagnant and you, you know, you pick something and you stay there. Um, it's moving. And so we wanted space that, people could come and find resources on trauma, but could also find resources on progressive faith and memoirs of queer Christians and, you know, all sorts of different uh, spaces and not feel like I need to be an atheist or I need to deconvert or I need to be secular or I need to be a progressive Christian or whatever that looks like. Um, we wanted a space where actually where you are is exactly where Totally you are fine. supposed to be and that's totally okay and you can move in and out of that space. Um, but we really wanted a point of difference in that um, that we are not anti any of these things. We are not anti-God. We are not anti. I mean, the three of us sit in very different spaces on that spectrum of faith and spirituality even right now. So Mm. We wanted to ensure that, like, the the collective that we were presenting uh, had room for everybody on that spectrum. Can I actually, can I add something to that? Yes, please. Um, when it comes to resources, I think that's really important too, that there are, you mentioned, you know, there's resources that are going to land in all different places um, on that spectrum, but also that there's resources that are not just going to be helpful for practitioners or people working in even necessarily in a professional space with clients that are experiencing religious trauma. Um, but something that I'm personally really passionate about with this gap that we're filling is that there's also really good resources for those that are still part of a faith space but are wanting to make that a safe space Mm. and they're wanting to allow those conversations and they're, they're just still trying to figure out how do we allow this, which is not just their own personal journey, but when they also perhaps hold a position of power within a faith community. Um, and so that that's also, you know, it may not be our, our primary space that we're filling, but there's going to be really good resources for those that are walking with people that are on all different places in this, on the, you know, on this spectrum as well. But Yeah, for those that are wanting to make faith spaces safe um, for people to be able to explore and have doubts and ask all of the questions and land wherever they need to land um, is something else that I think these resources are going to be able to address. And I think if I had found a place like that, if I'd found a faith community like that early on, yeah. I did find a place like that just before I kind of slipped out <laughs> um but I think if I had found a place like that early on I'd probably still be there like I think it, it's it's interesting you know you kind of need to um we, we need to be open to all kinds of different experiences and expressions and where people want to be and um 
yeah, I would love to have found a place like that earlier on. So very, you know, excited to highlight those and to promote people's policies around safeguarding and, you know, like all the stuff that people are, are doing to make, as you say, face spaces um, more safe. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it's funny you say that because I actually think that uh, my like Chrissy and I would be the same, I think, had mm-hmm. we found a a safe space and an affirming space yeah um five years ago it would have been a very different story uh, mm. we might have a very different story of the way that the last five years has progressed um yeah and so I think in terms of like also being able to present resources um so that they're not just safe spaces but they're trauma-informed spaces and understanding imagine like (laughs) yeah I know like imagine like a trauma-informed affirming church like I it just is like (laughs) you know but there are people out there who are working towards that who are trying to do that and we love that Mm -hmm. um and and we want that because the three of us very much understand the role of spirituality um, and the role of faith in people's lives and in our own lives. Like, um, and, and having, you know, we're sort of sitting here saying like, had we found that it would have been, you know, groundbreaking and and potentially, you know, changing the, the course of, of the, you know, the last five years. But, um, you know, we know that faith and spirituality is is important for so many people. We just want spaces where that can be fostered in safe and trauma informed and affirming ways. Um, mm-hmm. And so we love we love the people who are trying to do that. Um, we are not those people, but we love them and we want to bolster them and and give them all of the support that we can and and the resources that we can. And so, yeah, I think you know we very much wanted the collective to. Um, target different demographics and fill different gaps and we might not be directly filling a gap but it doesn't mean that it's not happening anyway in that you know we're not directly targeting people who are trying to build trauma-informed safe churches but it doesn't mean that the resources that are on our website won't help in doing that as well so um, there are gaps that are potentially going to be filled by the collective that we perhaps don't even know about and we love that. We love the mystery of that and the and the surprises. Um, in terms of, I guess you know what the collective is now is not just what we want it to look like. We have grand plans. We are you know big thinkers, and um, we wanted to create more. Uh, and ironically, one of the things, uh, one of the first things that we will create moving forward is actually where we started, and we created the collective based on wanting to have a, a hub for for these. Um, so I guess, you know, I thought it might be nice to have a little bit of a chat about looking forward, what we hope the collective looks like in the next, you know, 12 months to five years and, and, you know, the things that we hope to include moving forward. Um, and one of those being, uh, an online event, which is the one that's coming sooner rather than later, uh, when we can have space and time. (laughs) And energy. Um, but um, Jane, maybe do you want to have a, you know, a quick chat about uh, what we want that online event to look like? Um, yeah. Mm. It was one of the first things I think you and I started to talk about was imagine if there was some kind of a, um, an event, we threw around a whole lot of different words like summit and gathering and all kinds of things. But, that we um, vetoed gathering really quickly. Yeah, we vetoed gathering. <laughs> Um, it's up there with a journey. But um, I think we will, yeah, we're, we're talking at the moment about an online event um, early-ish, maybe mid-2025. Mid-2025. Mid <laughs> but we just thought how great to be able to bring together, you know, people who are podcasting and writing and speaking and academics and, you know, memoirists and all kinds of people, um, you know, who we're wanting to highlight. Um, through the collective and so we you know we might do that over a couple of days and have all kinds of sessions and and voices and and as well as um as well as having an, an online event we were we're still kind of thinking well imagine if we could have sort of little spin-offs like little pods of people maybe in Auckland and Sydney and Melbourne and um because we're already starting to see people connecting mm. in places through the collective which is fantastic it's, it's you know a big part of the goal for us is just to act as um 
I guess, facilitators for that. We don't need to know about what you guys then do with that, but just like, hey, meet each other, you know. Um, so I think that's that's pretty exciting. Um, let's talk about things as they um, as they apply to our region and, and our two countries and um, and be able to interact in ways that feel really familiar with kind of how we do life in other ways, either through work or those of us who, you know, have been involved in churches where you do have annual events and conferences and things, it kind of just feels really normal. Um, so, yeah, so that's that's an exciting thing coming up where we want to um, highlight in a new way um, some of the people in our area who have been really helpful um, in our own journey but also just who are interesting and um yeah doing good things yeah and I think what's going to be really great about that is that we we want it to be uh we want it to be something for either practitioners working in the space or people who have lived experience who are survivors of Mm. religious trauma or people who are just like interested in it who are just curious um Mm. people who are in faith spaces out of faith spaces we just want it to be a and all things religious trauma of highlighting people who are really interesting in their field, uh, but also who are experts in their field as mm. well, uh, and and a mishmash of the two because we need both. Um, mm. And, um, I mean, in terms of uh, the little pockets that Jane is talking about, one of the things, you know, one of the other things that we would like to eventually be able to have as part of the collective are support groups. Um, mm. and we know because you know, communal support is is needed and is really helpful in terms of validating our experiences, feeling less alone in what can be a really isolating um, experience, particularly when people, um, you know, if we, if churches do one thing well, they do community well and often mm. you lose that. Yeah. And, uh, and it's vital you know, we know that we are hardwired for connection and we heal in co-regulation and community and all of those things. And so um, to potentially create uh, spaces for both in-person and online uh, support groups to connect and to feel seen and to feel understood in hearing other people's stories, not just in sitting across the across from a therapist or a practitioner or something like that, um, but to just be um, in it with people who are also living it, who you know mm. understand the language, who understand the um, what it is like to actually live it uh, and to potentially be living it still, um, but we obviously want to do that in really safe ways um but we want them to be a really um nourishing and uh validating space as well um yeah i have drawn so much courage from people's stories who are like uh, further down the track than me over the years mm -hmm. and just go oh can you say that out loud (laughs) yes publicly oh gosh okay um, so I, I'm excited about that is just being able to um, lend people some courage and lend people some hope mm-hmm. and um, yeah good. yeah absolutely and I mean I think even just like if you just look at like the small subject of the three of us we mm-hmm. are also all at very varying stages of uh, you know religious trauma healing and deconstruction and whatever language you want to use around that Um, but we are all at different stages as well. And you can learn in either direction. You can learn from Mm. the people who have gone before and who are, you know, 10, 15 years ahead of you, but you can also learn from those who are in the thick of it, who are, um, who are untangling in the present moment. And so I think that's the beauty of community spaces, um, is that cross generational learning and that cross um spectrum learning as well uh and hope like you said so um the third thing that we really want to be able to eventually down the track include as part of the collective is just some training um and not necessarily like we are not creating like a a mass (laughs) a mass like two or three year thing but like little pockets of training (laughs) of um 
of helping other practitioners understand, um, but also in helping people who are living it understand perhaps what they're going through as well. Um, so Elise, perhaps you can talk a little bit about what we ideally want those trainings to look like. Yeah, I love that language of little pockets of training. It sounds so much nicer than, um, you know, we're going to put all these courses together. <laughs> create a diploma. <laughs> we need to, we need we're not creating a diploma. <laughs> <laughs> no, we're not. Oh, my goodness, I'm glad we're not. Um, yeah, I'm, I'm really excited about the training. That could potentially be because my background is in training and teaching, um, although I'm really looking forward to reclaiming that in a much healthier space. Yeah. Um, but these little pockets of training, um, yeah, I think you know, um, everything that we've talked about with those that are experiencing, you know, currently untangling and trying to work through trauma, um, you know, we would love to be able to put together these little trainings that can go alongside things like the support groups mm. um, where you're doing, you know, the personal work, but also then growing in your understanding of, you know, what is this? What's What has happened? What is happening? Um, you know, how does this connect with the things that I'm feeling in my body? Mm. Um, you know, just lots of different topics, um, which I'm sure we'll, we'll have lots of, but yeah, we'd love to get, you know, those those voices from Australia and New Zealand involved in the training um, for expertise, but also for stories, for the differences that are experienced. Um, you know, we talked about all the, the different denominations having their own language, potentially having those small trainings on, you know, how to understand language from someone, you know, that's decided to exit from the Jehovah's Witnesses or mm. from you know, mega churches or from a uniting church. Um, yeah, so there's, there's lots of different ideas that we're throwing around, but they these trainings will be aimed at, um, yeah, lots of different people. So those going through it, those that are supporting in a professional sense, and then those that are maybe just walking alongside others, whether it's just friends or family, um, and how they could perhaps best be supported and believed and understood Um yeah, so that it's it's not as lonely as it, it sometimes feels like. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And I think, you know, part of the, uh, you know, a core component of, of the collective was that we wanted it to be about community and connection. And so we, if there are, we are open to hearing people's thoughts as well. So if you're listening to this and you're going, I really want to see something on this topic, please email us, DM us on Instagram, however you communicate, um, because we would love to add it to our list of things to do. Um, and like I say that genuinely because, you know, I'm sure there are things that the three of us will come up with that we, you know, we want to add to that list of trainings, but we also want it to be purposeful. We want it to be what people want to hear and what people want to see. Um, and so to do that, we need people to tell us. Um, and so by all means, if, you know, if you are listening to this and going like, I want to hear or see information or resources or training on this particular space, um, let us know. We want to know that as well. Um, in terms of that community and that connection, um, if you are a practitioner, here is Jane's little pitch about joining us. <laughs> No, <laughs> join us. <laughs> the links will be in the show notes. Um, yeah, join us. It's like it is such great value that, you know, being part of a growing community um, of other practitioners, a network. We have a Facebook group that's just for practitioners. Um, we're all learning from one another um, and it's a it's a great place to be. It's, it's just I think it's exciting and the feedback that we've had from the practitioners who have already joined us has been really encouraging and lovely and um, I think people just really see the value of being part of, of something like this. So yeah, jump on and, and have a look at what's um, involved and yeah, come along. Yeah, <laughs> come along for the ride. We, we love it. Mm. It's a, um, But yes, as Jane said, all of the, the links will be in the show notes as will, um, you know, the three of us have been, I mean, it's obviously my podcast, so of course I've been on it, but um, 
the three of us has shared have shared our stories on this podcast um and i think you know part of what we wanted out of this as well is that we actually just want to connect on the fact that this is not something that we're sitting in our little like high horse going, we need to talk about this. You know, we are in the thick of it and we are always, um, you know, navigating it with our clients, but we're also navigating it as humans as well. Like Mm. it's just, you know, there is always things that pop up that go, oh, like, oh, didn't realise that was still there. That's interesting. And so, like, we are not sitting here as experts of religious trauma, but we are sitting here as practitioners who are passionate about religious trauma who also just happen to have lived experience of religious trauma as well. And so, um, you know, part of part of that is being able to share our story and connect with people on a, on a personal level, not just on a professional level. So, you um, those links will also be in the show notes of uh, the three episodes on our story. Um, and uh, we hope, I mean, we hope that you find the collective a place where you can learn and understand. Um, but also we hope you just love having something like this being created in our part of the world. Um, you know, it's an emerging space uh, and we're excited about it. As you can tell, we've just talked for 40 minutes about it or 45 mm-hmm. minutes about it. We're excited about it. Um, and we hope that you two get excited about it. And whether you are a practitioner or a survivor um, or a friend or a family member of someone going through it, or you're a pastor or a spiritual leader, uh, we hope you see the value uh, in this space and that you also get excited about it. Um, so, Thank you to both of you for joining me for yet another podcast. <laughs> Just that um, I didn't have to talk about um, what's it, what's it called? What's the other one we did? That terrible show? Oh, Prosper! Oh, yikes! Yes, um, if those are wondering. Yeah, if people are wondering, um, you know, we did do a part one of Prosper. Uh, we did hint at a part two. Uh, we haven't yet done part two, so if people want that, also let us know and I'll <laughs> rope Jane and Elise back in. Um, the fun part of co-foundering something like this is that I have two people to rope in on podcast episodes, like whenever I want to, so that's also nice. Um, but, uh, and, I mean, speaking of future podcast episodes, uh, you know, stay tuned in a couple of months. You'll also hear Jane again um, because we're going to record an episode on how to navigate Christmas uh, post-church, mm-hmm. post-deconstruction or current deconstruction. So um, stay tuned for that. But uh, everything that we've chatted about will be in the show notes. Uh, we hope that you will come along and come and say hello. We are always popping in and out of Instagram and social media and things like that. Come and say hello. Come and connect with us. It's the part of this that we love the most is just yeah. being able to connect with people um so come along for the ride and come and say hello we would love to hear from you thanks for tuning in to this episode of beyond the surface i hope you found today's conversation as insightful and inspiring as i did if you enjoyed the episode be sure to subscribe leave a review and share it with others who might benefit from these stories Stay connected with us on social media for updates and more content. I love connecting with all of you. Remember, no matter where you are in your journey, you're not alone. Until next time, keep exploring, keep questioning, and keep moving forward. Take care.